Hey everyone, Adam here. Welcome back to Apex Mind. On this episode, I am pleased to welcome to the show, Linda Reynolds. Welcome, Linda. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> well, um, Linda, um, I don't want to get too much into it. I know that uh, you, you work in the training space in specifically in aviation. So do you want to give a background of, of what you do? Sure. Um, my husband is a corporate pilot and um, we started out by trying to um, improve aviation training. Um, I'm not talking specifically about simulator training, but pilots have to do a lot of other compliance training like human factors, um, emergency procedures. And so um, we felt there was a lot of room for improvement there. And so we started out um, with our local flight departments trying to improve training in that way. And then as we did that, we ended up developing a model for training. And now currently we teach that model to um, aviation minded people in the at the Transportation Safety Institute um, in Oklahoma City um, for basically for instructors, trainers, anyone that works with adults that um, really wants to, and it's particularly those in like in a safety um, environment, because obviously aviation is really um, safety focused. So um, that's what we're doing mostly now. We still work with flight departments as well, but, um, and in the safety space. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's super interesting to me because most of my experience is working with folks in more white collar computer-based jobs where I feel mm -hmm. like uh, your your opportunity, like if you make a mistake, it's not that big of a deal, but for a pilot, that is a pretty big deal. So I feel like training is a little different in that space than, than where I'm typically used to. Um, you mentioned that a lot of that stuff is very boring and impractical, or at least before you, you've started getting into this space. Um, so wh what do you do to try to address that? Right. So <clears throat> as my husband told me about aviation training, and again, you know, simulator training is different. There are unique problems with simulator training that we are working to address those as well. But um, like I said, the compliance training, basically, yes, very boring box checking activities. And we definitely said this needs to be better. So what we did is we went and visited local flight departments and then we actually just cold called a bunch of major flight departments. And interestingly enough, many people were willing to talk to us about training because they too were frustrated. And um, what we found as we talked with people were two probably major things that for us were um, items that we said, you know what, we can do something about that. And number one was nobody was asking people what they wanted when it came to training. There were a lot of canned products. Okay, it's time for your human factors training. Now just go and purchase a product. Um, a lot of online things. Um, any customization that was happening, especially online, people would say, we have a customized online training. Well, they were just putting the name of the company in there or maybe yeah. putting their logo in there. That was the customization. So, um, so we decided, you know what, first of all, if you're into a training, you really need to talk to the people who are going to receive the training to see what do you need? What do you need help with? Um, you need to talk to management. Um, and so that was, I think, key that every needs assessment would include the people. Because when we asked, they're like, has, has anybody ever asked you what you wanted in your human factors training? And it was simply no, nobody ever asked us. Maybe the training manager, maybe the safety manager, maybe the management, but not the people. Um, and then secondly, we found that a lot of the training managers and safety managers have never been trained. They were just promoted to a position, um, put in there as a, you know, a promotion, truly was a promotion, but unfortunately, now they're thrown into a job that they really have had no training for. And so they too were really struggling. What does good training look like? What should I be purchasing? What should I not be purchasing? How in the world would I ever design my own training for my own people? And they don't really know. They're, and, and there was really no venue to help them with that. And we're still working on that. Um, in corporate aviation, there is now a safety manager program certification. Um, and eventually we'd like to see a training manager certification. Um, however, that always runs a risk that then we'll get back to box checking exercise. But um, yeah, I, 
I would love to see more training managers. And then what we found is this, this goes across all industries, right? How many, mm -hmm. I did that on LinkedIn. How many training managers have ever been trained formally? And it, yeah. it was my biggest post ever because everybody's saying, we've never been trained and I'm in this role. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a big problem. You know, I, I think that's a, a good activity you're doing to address real, real world issues, like going to the people and finding out what they need to be trained in. Too often, whether it be in large corporations or even in small independent, it's all top down. It's, it's from the senior leadership and we, we tend to miss the needs of the people we're trying to support. We force that on them. And I think you even mentioned that it'll be this out of the box vendor content. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what, what are you doing to train up those, um, the, the training staff or the training managers? You know, I know there's no set certification there, but what are you doing to build their skill sets and give them that development that they need? Right. So that's how our model came about. Um, I specifically remember um, being in the car with the pilot and, um, and my husband, and I was so excited about training and just saying, I don't know why we have this problem. The training is so boring. Everybody hates it. You know, you walk in and you say, we're here to talk about training and they just roll their eyes. And mm -hmm. I, I remember specifically one said training, we don't need any more of that, you know? And I thought, I don't mean any more of that, you, you know, but I knew what he meant. We don't need any more of that kind of training, yeah. but really training should be something you want, you enjoy it. You know, it's going to make you better. So, um, yeah, so we, we, first of all, um, went into departments and, and modeled what good training looked like. And when they saw that it can be very um, individualized even, and very much focused on your needs, um, they were really encouraged. And then what we decided was that we wanted to empower the training managers to begin to create their own training. Um, and that's kind of how we got into the development of the model. Um, and then, some very good forward thinking um, professionals, like I said, at the, at the Transportation Safety Institute invited us to come and do a beta course. And then um, we've been doing that now for five years. And we've now been even including the training portion. What does excellent training look like? How would you create it? And how would you purchase it? in a safety management system um, course certification in aviation, um, there is this thing called safety management systems so that it's, it's a me, there's four pillars, but safety promotion is one of the pillars and safety training, in my opinion, and now it's growing is, is really your frontline defense for safety. If you don't have good training, then you've got a weak front line, right? Um, so accidents and incidents are more prone to happen when people have been poorly trained. Or unfortunately, they said they've been trained and it wasn't a training at all. You know, it was really just a information dump, an instructional course. Yeah, so. Yeah, um, yeah I, I know you and I have talked about that before, um, you know, in regards to, what a lot of the poor training is that's out there, it ends up being very one way and and just as you mentioned, an information dump. So what, what are, you don't have to get into the entire model if you don't want to, but what are some like key principles that you're focusing on to make it more engaging or to see more application or better results? In, in this case, maybe less safety issues in the aviation industry. Right, so the first thing we do is just talk about what is a training and what's not, right? So we define that as practicing a new skill or practicing an old skill in a new context. And obviously in both those definitions, the word practice is there. So if you're not doing something, right? If you're not actually physically doing something, mm -hmm or mentally practicing through a scenario, then you're not being trained. And that I think for most people is really an eye-opener. And, and truly for me, <clears throat> when we first started, I went to LinkedIn in the L&D space because I said, you know, I, I need to know what good training looks like. And as I got there, I found out that people were really confused in L&D too. And people mm -hmm. use the word training 
I have very specific definitions now for instructing and presenting. Mm -hmm. And in our model, we also call it tooling. So um, I'll share our strategy. One of our strategies is called the pit strategy, right? To pour, pull them out of the pit of boredom. So the first key is you present and then you instruct, train and tool. And not that they have to be sequential, but when you design, you need to be thinking of all three because present is the affective domain, what you believe. Instruct is the cognitive domain, what you know, and um, inst train is the psychomotor or what you're going to do. And then you have the tooling, which in L&D is the resources that you're giving to people. And I just find that, um, to me, once I clarified those four things, knowing that they each have a specific purpose, um, but they all intertwine, but if it's a training, all four really probably need to be happening. The tooling, maybe not quite so much, but, um, and what I find is people get mixed up between instructing and training, right? We think that if we instruct people, we give them information, we ask them to memorize, comprehend, analyze, that we've trained them. and knowing and doing are two different things. Um, so that's one of the strategies. And so um, once we started talking to people about what is training, what isn't, that light bulb, a light bulb goes on for them, I think of, oh, wow. Yeah, that's why I don't like our training because it's not really training. Yeah, I, I like that model that you shared. And I, I find that far too much training only sticks with those first two of the present and the instruct. And people think that, that that knowledge or that information is going to create the transformation or, or help these people to execute on these new skills. And as you mentioned, that's just such a small part of the story. Um, I, I do want to find out, because I know you said that it's not so much focused on the simulations that the pilots go through. It's more on the other aspects of training, like compliance. Um, what, what types of tools do they have? Because I would imagine there's some important safety issues and they're out in... I would say the field, but wherever they're, they're, you know, working, right. What, what kinds of tools do they use in, in the moment that's after the training? Uh, you mean like tools that we've developed that? Yeah. You need? Yeah. yeah. Either okay. tools you've developed or just tools sure. that, that would be accessible, like while they're doing the job or as they're kind of getting to the, towards those later stages of learning. Yes. Okay. So, um, well, yeah, there's not a lot of tools. I mean, checklists are huge in aviation, okay. right? So we have yeah. lots of checklists um, because there's lots of procedures. So um, one of the tools that we developed that came from a need is that we did a human factors training with a flight department. It was a one day training and there are 12 human factors. So that was, that was tough. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but I can say it was a training. So what we decided was, you know, these are, there are 12 factors and we can't go into depth on all 12. So in aviation, um, part of this safety management system is to have a safety meeting once a month. So we developed for this flight department, um, they're kind of like a facilitator packet mm -hmm. on the 12 human factors. So principle is that the safety manager can do one human factor every month for their safety meeting. And it's kind of a scripted packet. It kind of tells you what supplies to get ready, what to say, and it always starts with an activity. And then there's discussion questions and lots of activities that they already have outlined for them. All they have to do is gather their supplies, go into their safety meeting and lead it for their people and and go from there so that is a tool that we left so that the safety managers start to feel empowered that they really can tailor things to their people they can use good sound principles of instruction and training to start getting the ball rolling and that has been that has been really fun to watch. And um, in some of them, they said, you know, this activity didn't work so well um, and made suggestions. And then I rewrote some of them because I'm like, you know, I need to know in the field if this is working. So mm -hmm. that's one tool that we have developed. Um, another tool that 
we used in our class and now we're using at um, TSI for the safety management system training is um, and like an implementation packet so that like in our trainer course, trainer qualification excellence course, we require that as you go through the course, you bring a training that you already have, that you already do, or one that you're planning to develop. And then you work on that training as you go through the training. So you are learning, you're, you're actually making your implementation plan as you mm -hmm. go through the training. And now we're doing that with safety, safety management systems that people are taking their organization and thinking, okay, how am I going to promote safety? How am I going to, you know, um, have safety assurance? So they're, they're making their plan for implementation right as they go through it. And that people love that they, that's always one of the highest reviews that I, because what happens when you don't do that is they just go back and then nothing happens, nothing changes. So that's been really key for yeah. us to see some retention and to see people put things into action. Yeah, I, I like both of those examples because those are in a way like non-traditional training deliverables. Um, but I, you know that I've worked on projects very similar to that first one you shared where you're giving to mm -hmm. leaders who don't have a training background, you're giving them some sort of structure and guidebook to go by, even just for like a, a regular stand up meeting or, or whatnot, yeah. because these people do training, right? Um, it, it's something I've talked about a lot. There's a lot of training that goes on outside of the formal L and D industry. And I feel like a lot of times, um, you know, trainers and instructional designers tend to ignore them and they're just doing the official path. Um, and, and, and kind of ignoring these other audiences that are really delivering training and development, like the safety managers you shared. Um, I, I, I want to dive a little bit more into that implementation product. So that was, that was for the people, like the, the training professionals that you're developing. Is that correct? Yes. So they're coming to our course mm -hmm. in order to learn how to train people. And like I said, they're most, well, not always, I mean, they're not always just newbies you know a lot of them are very senior trainers but they never really had a a simple model that they can just follow with strategies that are easy to implement and so like i said as we so when we talk about how to present we say okay take your training what will you do to present in your training when we talk about instruct we say what will you do to instruct and then they make a plan they make up their activities they write down their discussion questions so when they leave okay obviously we're not going to do the whole training but they've taken one skill basically we take one skill and we say you're going to trade one skill and then you're making a plan so when you leave you've got that part done yeah. And then you have to go home and finish, but you've got a good start. And yeah, they're that's, excited. That's awesome. I, I'm always a big fan of any kind of application. And that sounds like that's one of the best ways to do it is to apply a real life project and have them work through it as they're learning your model. Um, do you, have you noticed any trends of like specific things that these, these training professionals have gaps with or want development in? I, I know there's things that I see as trends. I just want to know if they're, yeah. they're matching up with the things that you see. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody feels pretty comfortable when we get to instructing. Everybody knows how to make PowerPoints. Everybody knows how to do like, you know, some testing and those kinds of things. I think they all say to me that the one area they really lack in is the present, getting the effective domain, getting people involved, getting people to buy in. Um, and that's, um, you know, that's what we really hit hard. Um, so I, I can talk to that too, but then also when it comes to training, um, we teach what I learned from James Asher, which is the total physical response method. I learned that in my um, French for children, teaching French to children um, degree. So, um, and it is simply that I do, we do, you do. And every time, it's just, people have been trained to just maybe demonstrate I do, but we never, we do together. It's always, I'll do it. Now you go and do it. And um, 
that I think for people is a real eye opener that you need to do it with them and you need to include feedback. And that's just, you know, most people just assume if I demonstrate it or if I tell you about it, now you'll go home and be able to do it for yourself. And I think that stage of working together and practicing and practicing with feedback is, is key. Um, yeah. And then I said, like I said, present, how do you get people to buy in? And that's, that's really at the heart of our model, I think. Um, and so we have specific strategies for that, but our model is called Solomon's facilitative model. And that name, although it doesn't flow off the tongue, it is, it is what we wanted to call it because number one, we named it Solomon's because um, it is based on the idea that everybody has wisdom. And um, we define wisdom as knowledge, situational insight, and resolve. And every employee that comes to your training, so if you have a room of 15 people and you just sit there and spew out your wisdom, and that's all that happens you've just missed the wisdom of 15 people that mm -hmm. you could have included and you would have learned from and they would have learned from as well. And so it's a facilitative model because the goal is to not just train people to do something, but it's also to bring out that wisdom. And what happens, and, and I think we talked about this a little bit um, through LinkedIn, but you obviously are going to find things beyond just the procedure or the skill that needs to be trained. Because what happens is as people start to apply and they start talking about how we're going to do this, you start to hear things that might be some flaws in the system, some resistance from management, um, maybe a lack of some, you know, lack of equipment, uh, maybe some software problems. And those things start to come out, which is great, really. And in my opinion, when people say, how can we get a seat at the table? I, to me, this is where I think, you know, L&D can really shine because as you hear these things, I, I feel like you become an advocate for the people. Like mm -hmm. they can tell you stuff in a safe place. Like, okay, we'd love to do this, but, and then you can go to management and say, okay, people are ready. They've got the skill, but we need to make some, you know, some adjustments here. Um, it, it, you know, and, and then you get the, you, but you have the big picture from the organization too, right? Like, like you, I know you guys are all individuals, but here is how it fits in. So I see L and D kind of being that, that go between, but anyway, yeah. a facilitative model brings some of those things out. Um, so that's kind of the heart of what it, what it's about. Um, and, and, and that's the way we teach people how to train others because we want people not to just train, you're not a robot, do this procedure and it's good. We, we want the interaction and we want the discussion and we wanna see how is this gonna work because they always find things that, okay, this procedure looks great on paper, but it's not gonna work this way completely because we have some other issues that whoever created the procedure doesn't really take into account. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's so much benefit to involving people and um, really making learning contextual to them as individuals. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to rehash all the things that you mentioned there that are absolutely true about getting people involved and then pointing out things that maybe the learning didn't originally address. So many good things there. One additional benefit is I think people learn more when um, you, you bring them into the learning even if the same exact information is presented than would have been presented otherwise, they are now bought in because they know that, okay, this is, this is for me, this person cares about me. Um, you know, maybe even just acknowledging their prior experience will open them up to learning. And so I found that, man, th these are individuals. Let's, let's actually like treat them as that versus, um, unfortunately the packaged, you know, out of the box, here's, here's what the knowledge is that that's kind of the older way of learning. Um, so, so that's really, really awesome. Now is all this training that you do, is it all in person? There's no, is there any virtual type training involved as well? It is, we, we have tried, we've tried some virtual, um, um, <clears throat> we've done it with some flight departments, um, where, somebody took the supplies out and we had a remote location and then we did it in person. There were a lot of good things that happened with that. Um, 
then we've tried it just completely virtual and you know it's it's just too hard it's it you know the, they start to laugh i can't hear what they're saying and it's just it's just no i don't like virtual yeah <laughs> I, don't like it all. I, I i get that as someone who's done a lot of virtual and i've also done a lot of face-to-face -face facilitation i think um that engagement or that individual involvement is much more challenging in a virtual space. Yeah. And especially I would imagine in, in this kind of environment where these people are used to working together in person, yes. um, because that's, that's the industry they work in, you know, it virtual is even harder, you know, it'd be like you're training people at a retail location virtually, but they're all in one room together and you're separate from them. You know, it's, yeah. it, it does make sense in that perspective. I was just uh, going to see if, some of these these uh, principles apply differently virtually, but I, I would understand that they're probably a little bit more challenging to get people in, involved and engaged and and get their individual contacts when you're not in the room with them. It is it is tough, it, and you know you can't be all things to all people. So we've really been focusing on the in person because I think, yeah, it. I'm kind of an advocate for that too. I see so much, you know, hybrid um completely virtual and i just i see people all the time just really poo-pooing the the live in-person training but i i just believe that that's especially if you are in an organization and you really want to build a culture where people care for one another they're working together they're not you know adversarial i believe training done well and training done in a facilitative way not only gives people the skills but it also builds a community mm -hmm. um and then for us in aviation you know we want a, a safety culture we want a culture of safety so you know that's just not going to happen unless you start talking about things and um innovating together i guess and i and i see that happen yeah. um, when you do those kinds of things so yeah, I, th I think the the perception against in person training. I mean, even before COVID happened, I, I think yeah. that perception was largely because a lot of training that was being done was ineffective, oh. and businesses looked at the cost of that training, and it made sense to cut it and make it cheaper and make it easier to distribute via e learning. Um, and I think some positions I've worked with, um, you know, if you're having a lot of people go through, um, it's a larger company and it's like Walmart hiring for their front line or a call center hiring for, for call center people. You got to get people through and it's got to be packaged. But if it's a very specialized position, um, you know, you're working with pilots. I've worked with like network engineers. Specialized position needs individualized training that builds over time. You can't just have a packaged solution for certain job job types. No, but I would advocate too that even those, even those, what, just even when you're onboarding people, I mean, it's still, to me, that first day when you go mm -hmm. into your training, it sends a message, right? I mean, if you get set down in front of a computer, nobody talks to you, you just flip next, 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 you look through the manual, watch a couple of videos and call it good. And that was your first day. I mean, my children just started at the grocery store, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, they're looking forward to getting to meet people and their first couple of days are, I'm just sitting in front of the computer and I don't really know anyone yet. I mean, yeah. it sends a message about how worth your worth, I think. It sends a message about how we treat each other here, it sends a message about how much you really care about safety, right? I mean, they've had some, you know, um, workplace violence training that, you know, it was just pretty much a watch a little video type of thing where there wasn't really a lot of scenarios or, or simulations, you know, so I know you're trying to get it done fast. I know you're trying to save money, but it kind of sends a message to people like we don't really care about your professional growth. We just want to get it done, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I know like the the last employer I had, we worked on onboarding and it was it was virtual. It was during the height of COVID. Everyone was working all over the country in different mostly from their homes, right? right. Um and and I think the the coursework that you're describing, right? The online self-guided type stuff, that was a part of it, but I always found the most important thing was 
daily meetings with them, setting them up with a work buddy, um, and, and uh, ensuring their manage, manager meets with them in the first day and then also the first week to set expectations. So things that may not be seen as training deliverables every single time, um, if, if you're not in the capacity to run that entire onboarding program, you know, mm-hmm. as your L&D team, you know, having those human moments, like you mentioned, I think are very, very key. Um, mm-hmm. And then, yeah, go take your your um, online training on something if you have to. Um, but but I, I'm I'm with you. I think it has to be a balanced approach depending on the situation. And the important stuff should always be focused on. Um, I, I've seen a safety training that was done via VR because you can't really p- pull a weapon on someone in a training classroom. Yeah. Um, right. But I've seen VR that felt very real to the people yes. that actually simulated the store robbery, so to speak. Yeah. Yes. The, those, those pieces of technology are very promising for those types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but even those are limited in that, even if you can't pull a gun, but just the act of doing it and, and doing it together and thinking aloud, where would we go? What would we do? Even VR has some limitations that doing it together in your environment as a group could still bring forth. You know what I'm saying? That, Mm -hmm. um, so, and yeah, and and I don't want to be in that camp, but we talked about this a little bit, right? I don't want to be a naysayer for all these other things, but I've also decided in my own mind, this is the one thing I know. And the one thing I am working to know better all the time. And I do feel for L and D because I feel like you're constantly having you know, all these things. Um, Yeah. And maybe that's why people, I think, get confused. You know, I, um, yeah, we we get spread a little too thin and we always look at all these different technology solutions and delivery solutions. And and one thing that I, I found interesting that you mentioned earlier was that within the the niche of, of who you train and how you help them, that face-to-face is what works. And that's fine. Um, I, I'm certainly not trying to sell you on uh, on shifting that. I, I think different people in different situations have to approach how they support their people in, in the best way. Um, I, I do want to loop back because earlier you were talking about the importance of, um, and I think you just alluded to it as well, is you having those activities so that you can give people individualized feedback. And, and I've always found that helpful too. Um, sometimes people give practice, but it's just this one-way practice. I think you mentioned it was like, we, right? We're going to practice together earlier. Um, and, and feedback, I think, is very key. Um, and I have models I've followed before, but do you have any specific tips that are helpful for ensuring people are actionable on that feedback? They learn from it and they grow from it. Yeah, I mean, we, um, so a lot of what we've, we've found is that um, we keep our classes small. So we right now have our classes at 16 and we do a lot of small group activities and we'll ask the group together to demonstrate. Um, and I have heard from people repeatedly, they enjoy watching and listening to other people and watching them demonstrate so that while I'm watching them demonstrate, I'm learning from their feedback, right? And then that helps me do a better job when it's my turn to demonstrate. But, and so there's a key in that, that you don't always start with the same group, right? So everybody gets the same advantage. Um, And I think that, yeah, I, Well, and then we do individualized, um, individualized practice with feedback. And it's funny because a lot of times my husband is very time oriented person and I can kind of get carried away, but he always keeps me on track, but he will say sometimes, Linda, this is getting kind of long. This is getting kind of long. And I've tried before I'm thinking, you know, maybe we shouldn't do the individualized. Maybe we should go back to the small groups But every time we get the valuations back, there will be a good amount of people who will say, I really loved watching and listening to everyone do their demonstration because I learned from their feedback and I got new ideas from to hear what they were doing. And because what they do is they tell us what they're going to do in their, um, a lot of times they'll go through their own specific training and they'll come up with ideas. And so I think that, yeah, I guess my advice would be don't 
And, and you have to remember too, you know, that's the facilitative model. People, I think feedback often gets a bad rap. It's like, you know, I will tell you what you did wrong. And that's kind of the old academic model, right? I'm the professor, you, there's only one right answer. And if you get it wrong, then I will correct you. And that's your feedback. But, you know, in a facilitative model, you know, I, I can lend suggestions, but then, or ideas to improve, but then other people in the class can do that too. And it's, there's not that, it becomes more of a community training, right? It's not mm -hmm. my training. It's not the company's training. Now it's our training and we're training each other. And they know that I'm trying to improve and I'm trying to help them improve and they're trying to help one another. So I think in that environment, it's a safe place to get feedback. Um, and like I said, you learn from others. Um, and yeah, I don't see it being adversarial at yeah. all. I, I really like that you have the the peer feedback. I, a lot of us tend to listen to advice from people who are more similar to us. And even though a, a trainer or a leader may be more authoritative, um, people tend to listen more to, to people who are at a more peer level or more similar to them. And, and I think that's great to be able to listen to the examples from each other and also give feedback to each other. Um, so I, I think those are great um, examples. I, I do want to touch back on, you mentioned simulations earlier that the, the simulation part of, of the job isn't as much kind of what, what you work with, but I would imagine for pilots in a uh, high risk for mistake kind of situation that, that those have to play a big part of how they're trained and developed and they get better at what they do. Is there any, do you have any perspective on, on the simulations at the pilots or is that just so far outside of, of what you, you work on? No. Um, in fact, that's one of the things that came through as we went around and talked to different flight departments. Um, there were, there was at least one chief pilot that I can remember. Actually, I think it was a safety mounter, but anyway, maybe training manager. Anyway, he was really frustrated because the scenario or the simulators, um, can become a, a box checking exercise too. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in the essence of time and money, right? Um, my husband's been a corporate pilot for over 20 years. So you can go to the simulator and do the exact same procedures every single year. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's great to start, but after 20 years of doing the same exact sort of procedures, it, it's, not, it's not a training, it's a practice. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with practice, but don't call it a training. So um, the second part of the definition, right? Practicing a new skill or practicing an old skill in a new context. Um, that's where flight departments have been working to say, you know what, we're paying a lot of money to come to the simulator and we want our training to be tailored to us. So we don't want the same things every year. We want you put in a new context. So we would like to have um, a crosswind on this, approach. We would like to try these different airport landings, places that we haven't gone before, places that are new. Um, and so they starting to ask for um, a more tailored simulator experience. Mm -hmm. And um, there's been some resistance, but I think it's it's gaining traction. And, um, you know, it's, I shouldn't say there's been a resistance, but I think, you know, whenever you, you approach a provider, um, you have to find ways to speak that you can each understand together, right? Um, sure. And, and but is, I'm proud of them for asking. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I was no, just going to ask if this is like a vendor that provides the simulations and, and they give pushback when you're asking for these new scenarios or these new variables to be built into them. Is that what's happening right, here? Right, right, right. It's not, it's not an easy, I mean, you have to program um, the simulator and things. So it's not an easy ask, really. Yeah. Well, I, I think a lot of us have been in that situation where, I mean, it may not be an external vendor. It could be, um, it could be people within the company we work for that are running the environments that we have to use to support the people. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people in, in L and D struggle with like 
training environments or simulation environments, because oftentimes either they're not there or they're missing features or whatever the case may be. Maybe like you said, they're out of date, right? They're not up to how people are using that system today. Um, yes. So I think that's a very real problem that a lot of us face in, in, in a lot of industries. And we have to find ways to, to work around that. Um, yeah. since, since you're, it sounds like you're focused more on the safety and compliance side of the house. Do you have to find ways to, uh, adapt to that where these simulations have gaps and they're not providing the experience that the people you're supporting need? Yes. I mean, um, well, in the simulator, yes, that happens. And it happens in just the regular, you know, in-house compliance training too. And so mm -hmm. a couple things to that. Number one, um, I do believe the power for a lot of that comes from empowering the people. So that's that it wasn't in the beginning purpose of our training model, but what I'm finding is that the more we train people and empower them with the right words. So for example, just giving them a definition of what training is, those are empowering things so that I, I and anybody in LND, you know, you can't advocate for everybody for all things, right? So the more we can empower the people to know what training is and what it's not and what it's composed of, the more they can advocate to their vendors. In fact, we created a checklist to take with you to a vendor, questions that you can ask them, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and then we have a, a checklist, whether it's substandard, standard, or excellent training. And so these are things that empower people to go and advocate for what they need when they want to purchase, right? Um, and then the other thing is that, yes, yeah, so I can give you examples. So for example, when it comes to in-house training, um, flight departments are required to do emergency procedures training. And so for example, they're required by compliance to shoot off a fire extinguisher every time they train. Okay, so, you know, shooting a fire extinguisher is not a, a very difficult procedure. And, you know, you've done it a couple of times, you probably have that down, right? But yet you're supposed to train on that. So um, it takes a little creativity to meet compliance and still have something that's meaningful to you. But as an example, there's a lot of ways that you could shoot off a fire extinguisher that you haven't done before. So um, a good friend of ours, professional friend, does workplace com workplace violence prevention. So we, um, in the flight department, you can have workplace violence prevention and use the fire extinguisher as a potential weapon, right? So you can oh, set wow. up an outline of a person and now you have to use the fire, you have to shoot it off, right? So we're meeting compliance, but we might have a relay where it's like, who can get it out, unpin it, shoot it and be done the fastest. So now it's in a new context, right? Now you're under pressure to come do it quickly, or you can have an accuracy and, you know, from different positions, you know, there's lots of ways to get creative and say, you know, we're still meeting appliance, but we're doing something that's practical. We're doing something that has a potential that meets a need, right? Um, so it's just a matter of kind of being creative and just even little steps like that. It's like now we've done one thing that we had to do, but it was meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like the ad of, I'm always a big fan of adding extra challenge to training. I think most training is far too easy. I like adding competition, um, where it's, where it's applicable, where it makes sense. Yeah. You know, you have this yes. like relay this challenge. Um, yes. and, and dare I even say, maybe there's a little gamification in there. You're adding, you're adding some gaming yeah. element to something that could be routine and boring, which is your, your routine fire extinguisher training. Um, you know, I think sometimes a little creativity will make it more memorable, or at least you're satisfying that thing that could be a checkbox thing, but you're making it a little bit more interesting. And I think yeah. that's great. Um, yeah. We're, we're getting a little short on time, but I have a few more questions. Um, I, I, I want to touch on, you mentioned like after or on the job resources are somewhat minimal. There's really just the, the checklists that they use. Um, and, and obviously I, I don't think there, there could be a, like a computer database with resources. They need to know their stuff. Um, but when, when it comes to going through your training, 
what do you do to ensure long time learning like after the session is over that that people are applying that learning down, down the road afterwards right so um yeah that's a that's a hard one like i said um we have left some um, kind of some facilitator guides. Those are good things. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think the implementation plans that they do during the trainings. Um, and then, you know, another thing that we have found helpful is that once again, I said, when it becomes our training, people take ownership. And so we have seen um, accountability plans that they set up kind of among themselves right, that um, they have some goals and then they they kind of hold each other accountable, especially like, um, you know, in a flight department, they're, they're a pretty close-knit group of guys or, and gals. So um, just to have them give some accountability and that's, you know, that's kind of one of the nice things about an implementation plan is that it just comes naturally. Like, I don't have to say to you, are you going to hold yourself accountable? And who's going to hold you accountable? They just kind of come up with that themselves, right? Yeah. Um, and I think also in that is management buy-in. Um, when we do trainings, we try our very best to have management participate and participate on the level, just like everybody else is participating. It's not like management does anything separate. It's just we're all here, we're a group, everybody's participating. And um, I think that really helps because then they buy into it, they see what's going on and maybe they don't necessarily um, practice the skill or, or do the skill um, repetitively or daily like everybody else, but they, they buy in and so they want it to be successful too. Um, so I do think that helps. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's probably the biggest challenge, I think, is to make sure it keeps on going. Well, I think it's a challenge for all of us, but you gave me, I, I think, like four or five really good takeaways that people have. I mean, they get their facilitator guides, they create their implementation plans, they have, um, you know, accountability plans within that. And, and getting management buy-in, I'm so glad you said that, because I think that's one of the biggest things, just, just training people on something will not create long lasting change unless the people that are leading them are also on that same page with them and, and doing the same thing with them. So I think those are all great examples. And, and I appreciate that you shared them. Um, a couple, couple more things. Um, so first off, where can people find you or connect with you if they want to connect, learn more about what you offer? Where's the best place for people to reach you? Yeah, our, so our website is flightlevelgroup.com. Um, or, you know, they can reach out to me by email. It's lreynolds at flightlevelgroup.com. Awesome. And, and I know if it's okay with you, I can also put your LinkedIn in the show notes so people sure. can connect oh, with yeah. you there mm -hmm. as well. Sure. Um, so, so I'll put the links to all those in the show notes. So if anyone wants to connect with you or reach out, they can, they can do so in that method. And then uh, Linda, the last question I have for you is something I ask every guest, because I'm just interested yeah. to know what people are learning about. So What's something either personal or professional that you've learned lately that's been a benefit to you? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, Kyle and I have been really delving into what is a safety culture and just how to really use training as a means to building a culture um, and, and building a culture of safety, right? Um, I think every organization has a culture and how can you shift that if it's not quite what you want it to be? Um, I do believe that the more we do training and we do it in a facilitative way, I, I, I just love meeting people and seeing what comes from um, the opportunity for them to share their wisdom. It, it just blows me away every single time. And every single time I and of course, I think, wow, we have some amazing people in some amazing jobs. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I think the more I do it, the more I'm learning that training really is a very powerful tool. And I would love to see it just one day have a good reputation again. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I think you're doing a good job to use training to create culture and especially around safety in such an important industry. So I, that, that's a great takeaway. Thanks for sharing that. 
Um, but Linda, thanks for being on. It was great talking with you. I hope we can do yeah. it again one day. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate Ab it. Absolutely. It and to everyone at home. Yeah. They, thanks for listening. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you guys next time. See you next week. Bye-bye.